I think the, the most the most unsettling moment for me in this um, incredibly, I mean, I, this is the second time I've seen it. I'm more impressed this time than I was the first time, and I was considerably impressed the first time, is um, this notion stated by the head of the Native American Museum in Washington, D.C., who's almost in tears, it seems to me, that um, the notion that, that, that basically um, that nuance is now dead. Nuance is a quaint idea. Nuance is a quaint idea. And he's all but weeping. Um, do you, do, how do the three of you react to just his statement, the assertion, the poignancy, um, um, and, um, and arguably what it means if he's actually right? What if we begin there? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we look at you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, this is Paul Chot Smith, who's the curator of the Americans exhibit at the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that he does in his writings and, uh, and in his curation is uh, try to complicate uh, the way uh, this country uh, views indigenous people and, and views its history. Um, and um, uh, and there is, and one of the things that's happened over the last decade or more is that the polarization in this country is so intense that it's very hard to actually sometimes get through in doing that complication. Um, so that he is uh, he is mourning that sort of possibility um, at the same time as um, in. And our intention is to actually make it possible for um, participants who are at one another's throats in the, at various points in the film to acknowledge one another, to see one another. And one of the things that we were told a number of times by uh, in, in interviews and in talking with um, uh, Native activists and scholars and reading was that uh, the absence of recognition uh, of acknowledgement, of not being seen, of, of, of be, uh, being thought of as dead, particularly in California, um, is uh, uh, because of the genocide that has happened, um, that people will tell California Indians, for example, I didn't know that you existed still. So um, in, the, in this kind of, of, of atmosphere, uh, you very often have to really sort of break out of uh, the uh, of the try to break out of the polarization to reach nuance, I suppose. Um, and one of the things that um, and you can start off too. I mean that uh, Karen Beesman, who's here, um, uh, is uh, told us early on when we were at Stanford, what three years ago, um, was uh, coming out of the idea of ceremony for uh, reconciliation and for community uh, in, uh, in native cultures was the idea of breaking the binary. Um, how do you make it so that this polarization is not the way you continue to repeat again and again and again like a neurotic kind of structure about what is going on? How do you break out of that? And uh, that was a sort of a basic guiding principle that we try to deal with in the in the movie, even as we were portraying people who were really different views. Well, he said it all, but um, I, I would just add, you know, that that the concept of breaking the binary was, you know, came to us in addition to be, you know being told that um, by various people along the way during the production. And you saw our closing comment by Robin Kelly. There's multiple points of view. It's not just um, a win lose um, kind of you know situation all the time. And so I think the guiding principle for us was um, to address uh, Paul Chad Smith's comment which is, you know, um, complexity, it's quaint, you know, and to, sh to show that there is internal diversity and vitality in life amongst Native American people, just like there's internal diversity in life 
amongst Jewish people or anybody else in the country, and that this is what gives us vitality, and we need to respect that and listen to each other. I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment, but so much of your work as the founding director of the Jewish Film Festival was to actually unsettle Jewish presuppositions about self. And, um, and in this film, your attitude toward um, unsettling presuppositions is somewhat more ambiguous. I'll come back to that in a moment. So this was an extremely well-made film. Thank you for that. And I just want to say as a filmmaker, we are taught as documentary filmmakers, uh, our opinion should not be visible in the film. It should be about everyone else and we should be a vessel. And it, you did a beautiful job of that. Uh, I love the quote at the end. There's, it's not two sides, it's multiple perspectives. But as a native person, I think I bring a different perspective to it. By the way, I teach a course here and a lot of my students are native students here at Stanford. And what I heard was not an absolute that this mural shouldn't exist. It just existed in the wrong place. I do believe we have to shed light on the atrocities of history. But what our young people want to see are our heroes. White heroes are celebrated in big ways in history. I recently made a film about Wilma Mankiller and most youth had never heard of her. So they wanted to see a mural that had black, brown, red heroes that they could be proud of. They didn't want to see themselves dead as they walked to school every day thinking about their future and how they might make a contribution and a difference in society. Now, could that mural have existed in a museum, uh, in a history course where we're talking about history? Absolutely. So what I think we've ignored in American Indian history is the middle part of your film. We are still here. We have gaming operations. We have the first native billionaire. We have ballerinas. We have Congress people. You don't hear about our heroes. You hear about the atrocities, which are important, but not without the other. So I think that was the message I took away around nuance. No, um... I, uh, some years ago, I created a, a book series, Jewish Lives, published by the Trade Division of Yale. And in conversation with the donor, um, who initially wanted to have a series built around admirable Jewish lives, my response was, if we did initiate that series, we couldn't include King David. We couldn't include Ju Judah from the Bible. Um, uh, King David, looking over at that, balcony and seeing that beautiful woman and doing away with her husband. Admirable lives, historical lives. It seemed to me in seeing this film a second time that there is an overarching point of view. And I wonder if the filmmakers agree with me. Um, with rare exception, the, by f the most articulate viewpoints including that of the Native American woman who teaches in Florida, extraordinarily intelligent woman. Um, she, she said that she really can't make a decision about this, but by and large, and tell me if, I'm, if, I, if, I, if I've misconstrued this, there is, there is, this movie is made of didactic shit, that, um, that in the end, and this movie is, does come out on the side of leaving those murals in the school. Now, it's uncom maybe uncomfortable to say that um, outright. Um, and, um, and this is in some ways a family debate between old leftists and younger leftists. To some extent, there's a generational divide. Um, there's an ethnic divide. But am I misconstruing what the filmmakers think? You, you, you know the best, you know this, the answer the best. I'll start. We may have different views on this. I mean, it's a collaboration. There are a lot of people involved. We had a Native American executive. Well, actually, many people. Involved. Many people. Uh, um, we had an executive producer who was very involved, who is Muskogee. But um, answering the question with the question, you know, um, uh, we grew a lot. This film wasn't really about um, our position or having a position. Uh, we really wanted to make a film that would... Um, be about the complexity. And to that, I'd like to um, respond also to what Val just said about um, 
the, we don't say the dead Indian, we say the murdered Indian. Um, and the uh, idea that meet me under the dead Indian is a, kind of a school motto that we've seen in the yearbook as years go by. You know, it's a problem not just for uh, Native people. I, I feel it's really important to kind of underline this, that um, white kids and other kids here meet me under the dead Indian and walk by this figure every day. It's in the smack dab in the center of the school, and you're normalizing something. You're normalizing the death of that Indian. I think Barbara Mumby talked about, you know, this, the stereotypes that you see. So it's, um, the issue isn't just for uh, the people who are complaining about it. It's the, for the people who aren't noticing it. And I think that um, part of the effort of the film was to help everyone notice each other without screaming at each other and, you know, that we need to listen more. I think also one of the things that during the course of the film, we actually went back and forth and had different, you know, different times when we were, oh, I agree with that person. And then the next person comes up, oh, well, I've, that's a good argument, you know. Um, and one of the things early on that we that hit us was that um, you really have to, the, the act of empathy, which sometimes is what is missing when nuance is gone, is, uh, you know, to put yourself somewhere in somebody else's shoes. And um, so we thought, okay, if our kids were in that school and the painting was a fine work of a uh, beautifully done um, pile of bodies from Buchenwald, um, would you want your kids walking by that every day and saying, meet you uh, under the dead Jew? And so I think that there's, you know, the, the location, what you're talking about, this being in a school, is becomes a very strong, uh, very strong argument, even as we also recognize that the artist was doing some extremely, uh, uh, you know, um, innovative and re revolutionary kinds of things at the time, um, because he was telling a story when Dewey Crumpler told us that when he went into the school to go to a football game, he wasn't at George Washington, he was at Balboa High School in San Francisco. He went in and he walked through that, that hall and he, and he said he was enraged by the corpse, which incidentally is life-size, eye-level, dead center of the school. And, uh, and, and then, you know, and uh, upset by the Washington and the enslaved people. And then he said, but you know, when I went into that school, I did not know that George Washington owned slaves, so that he was, uh, he was actually informed by the mural. So, you know, we also went, went back and forth, and we tried to present the back and forthness uh, that we experienced ourselves in going through all of those, you know, turns in the... the... Yeah, I want to um, respectfully disagree with you. Um, I, 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 I figured we would. <laughs> But I want to give us something to think about. And I'm just raising the question. I, I love it. No, I love this kind of discussion. Um, the question that we have to think about is sovereignty and self-determination. And as a Native woman, uh, I've worked with over 100 tribes, both in California and across the United States. And the greatest gift we have is our sovereignty. And uh, as a filmmaker, I was approached once by Senator Daniel Inouye, and he's now passed on, but he was the uh, head of the Senate Indian Affairs Committee, the uh, Democrat representative from Hawaii. And he said, uh, you need to have your own film company and make stories about your own people because we need to control our image in our and the media because other people control it. This was not painted by a native person, regardless of how beautiful it is. And I recognize it as a beautiful piece of art. I think what I heard from most native people opposed to it is we're still here. We want to control our image and our story. If we want to tell the negative history, we will, but we will balance it with our heroes and our other stories, our art, our culture, who we are in the world today. So again, I go back to it's complicated, but I feel the native perspective is we would like to paint our story and tell our story. So let me, let me just follow up, and then I'm going to call, call on, on Peter Stansky for a moment to speak a little bit about the artist. But um, Deborah, would would this argument be credible? And uh, and, I, and I'm not saying I necessarily support it, but I just wonder. I just want to test test this on you that with regard to. Um, 
uh, Jews who, um, unlike Native Americans, have, have articulated their history, have imprinted it onto um, American culture and beyond, that um, in the context of American Jewish culture, it's perfectly reasonable to do what you did so heroically as the founding director of the Jewish Film Festival, and something the Film Festival doesn't perhaps currently do quite as acutely, and um, which is actually to celebrate Jewish culture rather more than, as I recall, um, um, you did as the director and I was on your board. Um, and, um, and that in contrast to what Val is describing, a history that has been erased and that consequently ought to be treated in a substantially different way. Is that part of what we're talking about here? Uh, I think the Jewish experience and Native experiences have some overlap in terms of um, genocides, sovereignty, but they're specific. Um, our sovereignties are different. Our internal struggles are different. Um, so so there is apples and oranges in a way. Um, so they're both fruit. They're both fruit. There you go. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, but, you know, this question of who gets to tell the story, honestly, um, it's very central to our work as, as filmmakers. And we asked ourselves all the time making this film, can we tell these stories? Yeah. But, but you had a native producer. We had a native producer, and we were told many times throughout, you're the only ones who can tell the story because you're outside of it, because the passions were so, and continue to be, so high and there's such a difficulty uh, people uh, with people listening that in, in this case I think um, it was helpful to have outsiders come in and the further away we went like when going to LA and Washington uh, the more kind of coherent people's answers were and, and the thought, thought processes. There's one other thing um, that needs to be said which is San Francisco is unique whether it's the Jewish community here, the nat native community, um, and this struggle is, it needs to be said, is kind of, um, you know, Alice through the looking glass. The real problems in the United States are going on in places like Florida, where they're, um, you know, the banning of the inability to listen to the other side, the banning of LGBT books, or places like Tennessee, where they want to burn Mouse, the um, Spiegelman book about the Holocaust, in the, you know, the fires that uh, ministers are having in parking lots at uh, shopping malls, you know. So it's, um, you know, we're, we're experiencing something very different here that's very specific. And I think that part of the complexity that we're trying to um, promote is to be able to see things, you know, in this, the multiplicity of ways that they exist. Just to complicate things further, I mean, Peter Sansky is one of the great historians of, of left wing, of, 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 of the left. His work on Orwell is is is, is pathbreaking, and um, and 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 Peter Peter has offered to say a few words about about the artist just to make things even more complicated. Yes, it's something you may know, but I, I think it's particularly important. Uh, in, in, in this terrific film, but I think it's particularly important when it's being shown in Samford to say just a little something about Samford's connection. Uh, Victor Arnold the art. This is a wonderful biography of it by Ron Tierney. Uh, and and uh, uh, Victor Arnotov. Victor Arnotov was a, a, a professor of, of studio art uh, here, and and uh, but is is just a few sentences. His life story is quite fascinating. He he he, he was a white Russian who fought the Bolsheviks during the revolution, but but uh, but then he completely changed and 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 he became very left wing he became a member of the communist party but the the the, the, the wonderful little bit of his, of the stanford history he's the only stanford faculty member who was called in front of the un-american un activities uh committee the, at the insistence of the trustees with president Sterling's backing uh, Stanford had pay, said that no communist could, could teach at, at, at Stanford. The advisory board, two or three members of the advisory board, to their credit, voted against this, but it was official Stanford policy that no communists could teach at Stanford. The trustee said, after, and Arnikov did testify, he took the Fifth Amendment, he wouldn't say. 
And it, but the trustees went to Sterling, or you know, and said, "Well, clearly he's a communist," which he was, and 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 uh, he was fired. And I think Sterling, some people felt it was a bit hypocritical, but I thought it was extremely clever. Uh, Sterling said, "Well, we don't know. He didn't say." And so Sterling refused to fire him, and in fact uh, gave him a raise. And and uh, so so you know, I I think that Stanford aspect. Um, One little item just to add to that is that uh, Arnatov uh, went back to the Soviet Union and uh, died there. And he had uh, did uh, quite a bit of art, mosaics and so forth on buildings. And the place that he did those mosaics was Mariupol. So uh, we have no idea if any of that stuff has, has still exists after the, the war that's going on now. I, I want to make a comment that might feel a little out of left field, but I find it very analogous. Um, I wrote an article in a Stanford uh, publication right before the Washington Redskins changed their name. And that was a huge controversy about mascots. And there were people on both sides. There were some Native people that said, why should we change sports mascots? And most tribes came down on the side of, if you don't see enough of us in current positive depictions, we don't want the only thing you see to be a cartoon or some sort of you know, obnoxious, uh, unrealistic depiction. And I was very involved in the campaign to get the Washington team to change their name. And I feel that there's a similarity here because the only instance where it was accepted is when the Seminole tribe of Florida looked at it as an IP issue and said to the uh, Florida state, you can use our image if you purchase it as an intellectual property and we tell you how it should look, what colors to use, and how you should treat it. So where I see the analogy, again, is we're not depicted in positive ways enough. We're not depicted with our own art and culture and celebrated. And these students were simply saying, we don't want the main image we see every day to be a negative one that we didn't even um, have a, have a hand in creating. It is beautiful art. I mean, I, I don't think anyone in the film was arguing about the beautiful artistic nature of the mural. It's about its appropriateness and who has created it and what purpose does it serve. So I would open this up, but it just, just, I mean, it's, it's particularly poignant for me to be talking about this because as some of you know, I'm writing a biography of Philip Roth and Philip Roth's work was attacked precisely on these grounds and um, as harmful, uh, as perhaps ha as harmful as God knows Lolita, and that uh, would be, would have del del deleterious impact. And um, so uh, I, I, j I just mentioned that as an aside without drawing any, any comparisons between various, various sorts of fruit, apples, oranges, uh, Native Americans and Jews. Um, um, any any uh, comments, please? Just to mention one thing, sorry, um, that, um, a very close friend of ours, Aviva Kempner, uh, worked with uh, Ben West, who is Rick West's son, uh, and has now got a, a movie that you probably uh, you may have seen uh, about mascots, which we recommend. Uh, it's called Imagining the Indian, uh, and it's uh, it's uh, out around the country in lots of different places now dealing with the question of mascot. And Stanford changed their name, absolutely. The yeah, go, 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 go. Well, no, I mean, I think Stanford showed very good judgment. It, was it the 60s or the 70s? I mean, uh, said there was opposition, but Brady uh, yeah. died in his system. Right, but uh, Stanford was, the, they were the Stanford Indians. They thought it was respectful. Uh, Native American students and others did not, and they changed their name. They listened. Um, you know, we are the Stanford Cardinal, but the students prefer the tree. So you, I have two daughters that graduated from Stanford. So I just, you know, I think it's great that Stanford was a very good example of maybe not agreeing 100 percent, but they did it because it was the right thing to do. Um, comments, please. Uh, uh, yes. Oh, God. Okay. Well, there were a number of things that came to mind as I listened to your comments and as I watched the film. And one of them is that we unfortunately live in an era of deniers. Um, there's Holocaust deniers, there are genocide deniers. Uh, one of the things that this mural, and I have not seen it, so this was very ethical to me, um, it, it showed what happened. It showed, and, and we need to show what happened. 
But I think your point of not in the high school <laughs> was very well taken. Um, I was, I thought very briefly as, as I listened to you of um, the art in, in Afghanistan and in Iran that, were, that was destroyed. The, and, and when you destroy art, it's gone. Gone is gone. Um, and if, I, and so I, I thought several times, could this be moved? I don't know. I don't know about this. Turn it into an art museum. And close the high school. And move this high school to another building. Yeah. Um, all right, that's, that's a suggestion. One, one could also say that if nuance is dead, we have to close the university. But, um, um, uh, but yes, yes. That was one of my questions about moving the, the murals, and I know it's almost impossible to do it without destroying them. Um, I wanted to know if you had a chance to interview many of the staff members that work there, because it seems like they would almost kind of be in the crosshairs of this argument. They definitely were, and they, uh, from what uh, we made efforts to do so, and it w became clear that they had been told not to talk to the media. There was not a single article that anywhere we saw that actually was able to speak to a teacher at school. Uh, quite amazing. In, in fact, teachers that we had really good connections to wouldn't return our phone calls. So, um, and you know, I think that schools are sensitive to um, uh, putting their teachers and also their students in, into the middle of these kinds of things, especially now. Um, you know, it, when we were kids, schools were much more of a um, open place into the community. They were sort of community institutions that you could just, you know, you could walk into. And now uh, there's uh, not the same sense of safety in the community, especially given what's been happening with shootings in schools. So uh, that, uh, that kind of opportunity doesn't really exist. So even when, you know, we, we had to go into the schools after months of effort on a weekend to be able to film, for example, uh, so, um, so it's very, very restricted, uh, and for both good reasons, I think sometimes and bad reasons, but, uh, nevertheless, um, uh, gaining access to the teachers was clearly, uh, but there, are there, I just say there's a, a couple of teachers came to this screening. It's played a few times in the Bay area, um, in San Francisco and Marin County, and a few teachers came and, uh, have seen the film and want to show it in the school. So we're looking forward to that happening in the future. Well, that's a good segue. I want to come back to something you asked you asked of them, like what, what might be a solution if you can't move it. Um, as an artist, I consider my filmmaking art. Uh, my first critique when I released my first film was that it was too didactic. And I was very offended because I thought that meant it wasn't a good film or it wasn't creative enough. But um, since then, I have been required, and you will be, uh, they're, they're going to be releasing this on PBS. I've had, I don't know, 12 films on PBS. I am required to release um, viewer guides with teaching materials with every one of my films so that as it's shown, uh, there is a discussion around it that is guided by Native people. And so one of my thoughts is if you can't remove it, part of it is it, you're showing history without... Uh, the the ability to talk about it, to explain what was happening and why we have this mural here and what is the history. And I think one solution could be learning guides, an entire course perhaps at the high school on what the mural is depicting and why. Um, you know, education is the key. Can I ask the three of you this? Um, was there something surprising given the highly contentious nature of the discussion before the Board of Education's vote that there was complete absolute unanimity on the board of education yes yeah i mean that there was no disagreement that um that actually issuing any kind of of ambivalent response is is some um, well is is racist 
And so consequently, one, I mean, it was, this is what's striking about this conversation. It's a left-wing conversation. The, the old, the, the, those who want to keep the mural and those, and, and those who post to mural, it's an internal conversation. This is a conversation only on MSNBC. And, um, and, um, and the, 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 the question, the, I, was, I was struck that there wasn't, there, were, there wasn't a single member of the, um, the board who demurred in any way whatsoever. Did that, that strike any? Uh, yes, I mean, it was a, I think it was a particular situation that's sort of odd in, in, in San Francisco that um, uh, I think that there were some members of the board who um, had some reservations um, but who were silenced or who decided not to be there for the last meeting. Um, and um, I think, you know, the power, it's very powerful when there are people willing to say that you're an avatar of uh, white supremacy in your position. And so there was that kind of unanimity. I, and I think that there were, you know, four members of the board who were very strong on that, on taking that position. Um, three of them were recalled uh, by this, uh, by the voters, uh, not really about this issue. The issue that was um, uh, tantamount was the question of um, changing um, Lowell High School in, from a merit-based to a lottery-based school system, um, and also a little bit that the idea of the school board during COVID was spending its time working on um, some questionable renaming strategies. Um, so uh, it was uh, the school board itself became a major issue, which we decided not to really go into some of the complications of the of the politics of the school board. But it was it was quite remarkable that there was not really much of a debate on the school board itself. I think when you're an adult making decisions that affect affect minors, um, there is a responsibility that weighs on you. And I'm the board chair of the Boys and Girls Clubs in Indian Country, uh, so on reservations. And all of our teaching, even if it's happy about art and culture. Uh, it's trauma-informed, and we cannot neglect that our history affects our children and our youth, and they are the victims of trauma in their homes and the cycles of poverty, and that's very real today. And I felt that there were parents who made good arguments about the trauma triggering this was having on their children, and I think, again, I don't know the politics, but if I am an adult tasked with making a decision on behalf of youth, I'm going to listen to the trauma and the triggering and have to have to make that decision, regardless of how I feel about the art. One other, okay, go ahead, no. Yeah, so I'm extremely happy actually to see <laughs> fantastic both Val and then Brian and Alan. So this is, this is so wonderful since I've been teaching here at Stanford for the last 26 years, um, uh, exactly that. Cameras with these international human rights documentaries. Val was my guest several times with her films, and as also founder of the United Nations Association Film Festival, all three of you, you were our guests. Uh, so it comes to the education. I have to say from my classes that one of the most important films that we screen is exactly in whose honor about the Native American use and abuse of uh, mascots, and then all of our films and Gail and Hurt films that are dealing with the uh, um, Native American code, Navajo code, uh, and then uh, Choctaw code. These are all the films that I use for my classes here at Stanford. And uh, obviously, it comes to the respect and learning about the history that we don't know. And my students don't know about that history. And that's the key, and this is why this film is wonderful because it opens a great discussion why we don't know and where the teachers are on that position. So we have to bring your films and Val's film to the teachers and I'm wondering, my question is, who is your educational distributor? So, <laughs> and it comes to the education, so thank you, okay. It's Bullfrog Films is our educational distributor. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I love the film and I was just so moved at decision to include the, um, yeah, I think that would be loud. <laughs> oh, the recording. Um, 
the inclusion of the removal of the early days um, statue, and I was just moved to tears watching that. And watching that alongside this whole conversation, which I think it actually was very nuanced. And it showed all different sides. And Val, you saw me just shaking my head with everything you were saying. Um, and you know, even, even the board member who was saying, I don't even understand the arguments around this when we have black and brown people dying and being shot in the street. And then we have this depiction on this mural, which, you know, I didn't know too much about Anatov's work, but, you know, of course, I live with Professor Peter Stansky, so he's informed me. Um, but I, I can see the connection with Diego Rivera and, and the influence there and the importance of that work and the beauty of that work. And I agree, even if one student is feeling that they are not in a safe space, um, where they can be free to express themselves as who they are and be proud of who they are, um, then that is not a place of learning, right? But I think having conversations about it and having learning materials about it is important. And my solution would actually be, okay, don't paint over it, but put panels up with a different mural by an indigenous person take images of the mural that's there and include it below with information about what this is all about and all the different points on both sides and have a viewing of this documentary and of course around this mural um so anyway i really enjoyed the film you're hired <laughs> <laughs> Can I just ask you a question? If, if the, if if this causes trauma, as you pointed out, to even one student, it shouldn't exist. So how is there two sides? Well, I didn't say that it shouldn't exist. Yeah. I think it needs to exist in a different way. Right. I think the right. conversation needs to be shifted. I agree that. I, I mean, all I'm 40 now. So many depictions of indigenous and native people. This has been the imagery. This has been the story. Where is the power in indigenous people? Where do you see the community? Where are those images? You can't just have them in the National Native American Museum. They need to be in places of learning. So yes, there are several sides to it. And I think all of those sides need to be told. But I think this mural has had its time and it can still exist in a different context. And what needs to be up there right now is, is representation of the indigenous voice from the indigenous perspective. Not that it is one voice, you know, there's several different, I understand that, several different perspectives, but that, that mural needs to come from a different voice. And it can still exist, and we can still have that conversation, um, but in a different way. And that's a good segue to a question I asked the filmmakers before we watch the film, uh, because in every one of my films, as Jasmina knows, Yasmina, um, I have an impact strategy. So I will say to an audience like this, now that you've seen the film, I'd like you to get involved with this particular cause around Native women running for office or whatever. Um, and my question to them is, what would you like people who see this film and feel passionate about the topic, what would you like to see uh, from here? Um, well, land battle. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, the, um, uh, a, couple, a couple of points about that. One of the things that we've, we've tried to do and one of the things we want to be able to do, for example, is to, as we go around the country and as this shows around the country, is to be able to pick up on local uh, issues and struggles. So, for example, when we showed the film in Mill Valley, which was where it premiered, uh, the film was introduced um, by a um, coastal Miwok uh, a woman who is part, runs a thing called Alliance for Felix Cove, which is trying to negotiate with the National Park Service to get back her grandparents' house which is on, uh, on uh, Tamales Bay. Bay. 
um, and not for her, just for herself, but for her, you know, uh, tribe. So that you raise these kinds of issues in the process of dealing with the dealing with the film. Another thing that we're we'd like to do, and and there's um, which is exciting to us, is that there are a number of educators, teachers of teachers, who are working on um, uh, curriculum curricula about how do you use uh, controversy to raise the excitement level about history. So, because um, one of the things that we found is that when you get a fraught situation like this, that you get more clarity in a way about what the intensity and what the issues are. Um, and so we, we chose in this film not to, not to try, try not to completely affirm one side or the other, um, which would um, uh, eliminate the possibility of people seeing the other side as clearly. So we wanted to actually make that complication necessary because we thought that the history emerges from the battle um, in many ways and that the, um, uh, there are better ways to do the battle. And we think what you're raising about it, the educational structure and the study guides is what we are hoping to be able to actually go beyond just having the, the uh, questions that our teachers will ask their students, but to actually have um, uh, uh, people who are studying in education departments actually trying to figure out how is this, uh, using this movie as a kind of template, how do you use this kind of controversy in order to excite students and get them involved in the debate about what the history means? Um, and how, how to go about that. I mean, we've just signed up with Bullfrog Films, which is a very large educational distributor. I mean, the goal is to get it into both high schools and universities, thousands of them, where it's going to be discussed not just in um, history classes also, but art history classes, so that, um, because the other aspect of this is about art, and art has the role of art in our cultures, and, uh, you know, providing an opportunity for people to think about the questions that you raise about who does the art and what does it say, you know, when somebody outside of a culture is depicting a culture. So, final question, uh, which was your name? And, and Val, the, um, uh, the, what do you hope will be decided with regard, to, there's an open question with regard to the murals. And so um, she's um, offered a, a very interesting idea as to what might the scenario might look like. What are what are the three of you hoping will happen, and we'll end with that. I I, I love that question because I'm gonna. Well, I'm basing it on you. <laughs> I'm gonna throw out something a little um, radical, uh, but I teach a course here at Stanford, and what I teach about is when we see the dead Indian and the dead black man and the lynched in the in the L.A. mural, we saw the lynched Asian American, uh, black and indigenous. We have to understand that during that time of history, which was you know several hundreds of years, we were not allowed to own businesses. We were not allowed to become wealthy. We were not allowed to control our assets. I teach entrepreneurialism, and I say, so let's move beyond that. Let's start shifting capital. Let's understand venture capital, private equity. Let's understand how to take back control of our assets so we can then start to control things um, and, and control our voice and our power in this country. 98% uh, of our assets in this country are still controlled by white male-led companies. And my goal is to take that history, understand that it's negative and what happened, but how do we move beyond that and really take control? And my students are all on fire, and they're all going to start businesses, and they're all going to become wealthy and create their own murals. And Val, and Val so the, the, the murals in the high school? Yeah, I would, I would teach a class if they have to stay, uh, I, I don't want to destroy them. I appreciate the art. But to her point, if they have to stay, I would want to go into that high school and say, let's understand this history, its negativity, the trauma, but let's realize how we can rise above it and how we can then move forward. Filmmakers? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm for also for keeping the murals as an opportunity to teach, but perhaps with um, some covering of them. But, you know, there's not just covering them with panel. I mean, there's all kinds of high-tech things you can do with glass that you can turn a light on and off that, you know, enables you to see them when you walk by if you want or if you don't want. I mean, it's we're not limited to curtains anymore. Um, but it's a question of... Um, 
will. And I think that, you know, your point about the school board, we, we've got really large problems with education in California and in San Francisco and the school district and money. And um, where do the resources go? And should the resources be going to that kind of thing or should they be going to mental health workers in the schools when their kids are saying that they're traumatized by not just symbols, but the reality of life and, and guns and everything else that's going on. I mean, so, so this is, um, you know, it's, it's a minor thing. It, it's a symbolic, it's a symbolic thing. And, um, I think to put it in context that way is important. And Alan, final way. Well, there, um, Susan Cervantes, who runs a group called Presida Eyes Murals, which is a wonderful mural group in the Mission District, has sort of said, oh, she would love to work with people at the school to do uh, additional murals. Um, that's one thing that can be, that can be done. Um, I, th I think that um, this, this question of teaching the murals is, is very hard to do, but it is happening in the school now. Um, partially as a result of this whole sort of uprising uh, that, that's going on. I think that there's a question of, uh, of uh, and that, that is a, a, these are better approaches than um, uh, painting them over, um, which would, uh, seems like a kind of destruction which destroys an opportunity in a way too, as because that would be treating it as a kind of Confederate monument. And I think it's different than the kind of propaganda that was created around Confederate monuments in order to, you know, deal with a lost cause and so forth. Um, that intention is important, um, but that impact has to also be dealt with. And how, you know, how do you deal with that? And um, the, uh, what Jessica says at, at the end of the film seems to be among the kind of compromises of, of which there could be many uh, that you that you cover the murals, but then open them to teach them, you know, cover, or at least cover the, the you know, the, uh, uh, the images of, um, uh, of a, of a uh, Indian fighter with scalps on his belt, uh, or the, uh, the image of the uh, corpse uh, as the daily viewing of, of students until you actually bring some kind of critical mass to it. Um, because uh, the other part of it is that uh, to talk to your, um, is it Soba's point? Shoba's point is that um, I think it's really problematic for, for um, feelings of trauma to be vetoes. So that becomes another side to this thing that's, that, is pro that is a problem. How do, we, how do we deal with this in a way that's real that also doesn't make it so that uh, you get into a situation of people vetoing one another, because there are so many different, you know, uh, things that go on that are infuriating. Completely. But I also think the piece about validation of that trauma is important, and not dismissing it as, oh, these youth and their sort of triggers, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, um, Yes, I mean, I agree with you. It shouldn't just be, oh, let's paste over everything that is out there that could possibly cause anything. Any sort of so uh, a, a fascinating conversation, uh, a really brilliant film. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, and thank you for coming. Thank you.